Welcome to Excerpts from the Open Forum. On this program, we'll hear Mr. Harold Camping answering pre-recorded questions regarding issues from the Bible. Here's our first question. I was wondering if um, you could compare Numbers 2659 Number with... 26, well, or excuse me, Numbers... 26, verse 59. 59. Yes, sir. Let me look at that a moment. Sure. Verse 59. And the name of Amram's wife was Jochebed, the daughter of Levi, whom her mother bare to Levi in Egypt. And she bare unto Amram Aaron and Moses and Miriam their sister. Yes. And now Exodus 6.20, please. Exodus 6, 20. Uh, there we read in Exodus 6, verse 20. Uh, and Amram took him Jochebed, his father's sister, to wife. That uh, agrees perfectly with the book of Numbers 26. And she bare him Aaron and Moses. And so far it looks exactly parallel. And the years of the life of Amram were 137 years. Yes. Ah, God introduced some more information that we mm -hmm. have to deal with. And that blows the idea apart. Because if we didn't have that verse, the rest of the verse, we could, we'd have to conclude that uh, Amram married Jochebed and were the immediate parents of, of Moses and Aaron. But when it says that that he was 137 years when he died, and we have to factor that into the other information of the Bible, then we know he could not have been the immediate parents. That's not possible. I wonder how old he was when he get, gave birth to, to Amram and Jochebed. I mean, to Moses, etc. How, how old who was? Uh, Amram. Well, he didn't give immediate birth to them. It was a, it was, oh, I made the uh, it was a grand, great grandson or great great grandson who gave oh. birth, and he was in the line of Amram. And you know, in the Bible, when God speaks about sons, uh, they can be immediate sons or grandsons or great grandsons or great great grandsons. We have to look at all the other information in the Bible about that particular subject to d discover what God has in view. Yes, Brother Camping. Yes. How are you? Uh, just uh, two quick questions. First question is there's something that's been troubling me a little bit, and that is that um, I understand that you have said that uh, you uh, believe in like predestination and that in, in the beginning when God created the world, he already knew who was going to be saved and who is not going to be saved, and that he doesn't change his mind with that. He doesn't go back on that. And uh, But I've also heard you say, and I see in the Bible, talks about God being merciful. And so my question is, isn't that kind of a contradiction? Like, how can God, on and, and one hand, have uh, you know everyone predestined? He's made up his mind. He's not going to go back on it, and at the same time still be merciful. To, to save us. Well, for, the reason is, and this is hard for us to fathom, uh, but every human being is created in the image of God. We were in principle in the loins of Adam. We all come from his genes. And when he rebelled against God, all of us rebelled against God. But God does not lose the, the fact or change the fact that we were created in the image of God and therefore are absolutely accountable to God. So even though we're not one of the God's elect, here's an individual who was not elected by God to become saved, he is still commanded to pray God for mercy. He is still commanded to, uh, to seek the Lord. Uh, he never will do it uh, in any God-pleasing way because he... Uh, the only way he would do it is if God himself made him his, 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 uh, his uh, child. But God addresses that person as someone who was created in the image of God. 
and should be obedient, therefore, even though God knows full well he will not be obedient. And, and we must never lose sight of the fact every human being is absolutely accountable to, to God because he was created in the image of God. And in all the language of the Bible, as God speaks about his mercy and his love and his wrath and, and his patience and his kindness and so on and so on, uh, we, it's always in the setting that he is speaking to a people that were created to love him perfectly and who rebelled against him, and yet they still have to answer to God for their life. So are you are you saying that 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 in the end, though, he still can't he can't he won't have mercy on us, even though he's demanding that we do. If the, he's already if it's already since the beginning been determined that he won't save us. No, it, the problem is that here he comes to an individual. You are created in the image of God. You have rebelled against me. I command you to trust in me, to turn to me. You were created in the image of God, uh, and in, as such you should be obedient to me. But And I am a merciful God. Uh, if you will turn to me, I will have mercy on you. And yet that person will never turn because he has become spiritually dead. Even though he's... Uh, God still looks upon him as having been created in the image of God. He, uh, God also knows that that person is spiritually dead. That does not lessen the mercy of God at all or the love of God, but it keeps afresh in our minds and in God's mind the fact that every human being has to answer to God. We were created in the image of God, and that's, that is the setting of the whole Bible. Uh, here, here comes someone, uh, and, and the fact is, no, you were not created dead. You were created alive. You were created in the image of God. You are part of Adam, and, and you have rebelled against me, and, and uh, uh, even though I kept tell, telling you I am a merciful God, you never turned to me, and so now I have to bring my judgment upon you. And just uh, one last thing about the, the, the church age um, coming to an end. Um, I've heard you use, uh, like, uh, people have asked questions like, where are you getting this? And I've heard you use uh, many verses, such as uh, Matthew 24, verse 15, um, and, and saying that today Judea is, is the local congregation. Um, but is, are there things that are a little bit more, more clearer? Like, I guess what I'm saying is that it, it seems as though that you being someone who, who knows a lot about the Bible ha, has found these things, but um, it, it's, it, it's a little troubling to somebody like me because sometimes it, it's, it's, you question, is it your interpretation or is it clearly what's being said here? Well, it's, it's... It's a matter, uh, it is not an easy truth to absorb. I, I'll be the first to admit that. Uh, but it is spoken about again and again throughout the Bible. It, it, let's, let, let me put it this way. Here is someone who is a true believer, who dearly loves the Lord, and that's the nature of being a true believer. You have a new resurrected soul that God has given you in which you are happiest doing the will of God. And you are, and you've learned a whole, you're learning more and more as you go along from the Word of God. Now, because you are a true believer, you're, you're, you're in a congregation, and you, from time to time, you hear the pastor preach on something that you know is not faithful to the Word of God. He may preach a sermon on more, um, on, uh, on divorce and remarriage. I heard of one pastor who preaches that that if you get divorced, then you, it's like your spouse is dead, and that leaves you free to remarry. Where in the world do you read that in the Bible? So, you hear that kind of preaching. You're a child of God, and you're troubled. How can that be? And then you listen to your pastor, and, and then you hear something else, maybe, that he is saying, you know, that this might be a scribal error, and that's why this verse is saying what it is when it should say something different. And so you're getting more and more uneasy. What's going on? I, I, 
uh, my my church is not being faithful. And then you start looking around, and and you 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 uh, look at church after church, and you find that there's an enormous increase in churches interested in signs and wonders and tongues, and you know that's another gospel, and and so on. And you're getting more and more uneasy. Then you go to your pastor with some of your uneasiness, and you begin to ask probing questions. How could you preach that when the Bible says this? And you get answers from him that are not satisfactory. They're not, uh, they're not uh, based on the Bible. It's just that we Baptists believe this, or we Reformed people believe this, or the Confession says this, or whatever it is. And, and if you're a true believer, you're going to get more and more uneasy. And, and, uh, and that is going to make you sensitive to, well, I wonder what the Bible teaches about this. And then you hear people who are talking about the end of the church age, and you listen carefully. And if you're a true believer, you're going to find, you know, that, that, that's exactly the way I see it. And now, now, say that again. I want to read that passage again. And, and you're going to find that you're thinking just like the one who is teaching you that it's the end of the church age. It's interesting, you know, during the last several years, I have received quite a number of letters or calls on the open forum even from individuals who have of themselves concluded the church age must be over. They never knew anything about family radio or any teaching of family radio, but they have come to that conclusion because they look at the wasteland the church has become and they find just enough in the Bible to assure them, yes, uh, God somehow is pre- uh, talking about this, even though we can't tie it all together in a neat package. Nevertheless, it seems like there's something like that going on. Then they hear family radio, where it's been laid out in a more systematic fashion, and they say, ah, now, yeah, it all begins to f- fit together. And so everybody's testimony will be a little different. Everyone's experience will be a little different. Or it may even be more likely, and this has happened repeatedly, that because you're getting uneasy about what your pastor's preaching about this or that, and you start start raising questions, and and you speak up in a Bible class and say, you know, I, I don't find that in the Bible. And it won't be long, and you're going to get a visit from the elders or the pastor himself, and they're saying, you know, why are you in this church? You're a troublemaker. You're, you're causing unrest. You're raising up, you're raising embarrassing questions. Why don't you leave? Why don't you leave? And they might even tell you, if you don't leave, we're going to, we're going to uh, excommunicate you. And, uh, and uh, this indeed has happened repeatedly uh, amongst the local congregations. And so uh, each individual's experience will be different, but, but we'll all, if we're a true believer, we'll all finally come to the same conclusion. I do have to say that as, as a Catholic, I, I do it, uh, attend Mass, and it's funny what you just said. A lot of that just is, is uh, seems to be pretty clear that, uh, you know, I, I want to go because I, I, I feel like I get something out of being together with others, but I, but I do say even just recently uh, this past Mass that, that, I, that I had that feeling that there were certain things that were being said that I just... I. All right, I don't, then. and also with like statues and things like that, and there's too many, there's too many symbols well, all right, things all over the place, and that that I find troubling also. All right, there you have it. And but then, then uh, when you begin to hear someone explaining how all of this is happening, uh, then you uh, you say, oh, well, here's someone who has the same conclusion, but he's got a lot of scripture to back it up. Let me look at some of that scripture very carefully. You are listening to excerpts from the Open Forum on Family Radio. Mr. Harold Camping is answering pre-recorded questions about the Bible. If you'd like to hear more of Mr. Camping's teaching, you can hear and even download Open Forum broadcasts, Bible studies, and more. Just go to FamilyRadio.com and click on Audio Archives. Let's continue now with another question. Um, can you read Isaiah 
Isaiah 54, 17. Yes. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord, that is, saith Jehovah. Now, what is your question or comment? Um, I didn't really have a question about it. I just wanted you to read it. I oh, do have a, oh, I do have a question me. about... Um, yeah, yeah, before you ask your question, let me make a comment. This indeed is a very, like so many, <laughs> you know, when we start looking at the Bible, we always find wonderful, wonderful verses. But this uh, this is a verse, again, that gives all of us who are uh, finding that we are running uphill against what mankind wants to hear as we talk about the end of the church age or as we talk about the fact that Judgment Day is approaching very close uh, and so on. We're getting lots of uh, uh, unhappy people uh, and uh, slandering and revilifying going on. But, uh, but you know, uh, this verse... Uh, uh, as well as uh, like what we read in Revelation, what, when I have opened a door, no man shall shut it. And it's the kind of statements that reassure every one of us, just stay with the truth of the Bible and leave it with God to carry it out. He'll take care of it from that point on. But go ahead with your other question. Oh, great, thank you. Um, there's a verse, uh, I don't know what book it's in, but... Um someone makes a comment to the Lord Jesus um, in reference to praising his mother. Um, Blessed is the womb that bare thee. And Jesus sort of reproves them and gives them uh, a, a little bit of information there. I was wondering if you could read that and explain it to me. Yeah, well, that's in Luke chapter 11, I believe. 11. In Luke 11, in verse 27, uh, and it came to pass as he spoke these things, that's speaking about the Lord Jesus, a certain woman, I'm reading Luke 11, verse 27, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee and the paps which thou hast sucked. But he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. In other words, it's a very interesting and significant fact here that Jesus, in a very abrupt and direct way, turned the attention away from his, uh, from Mary, uh, to every and and put our attention on every true believer, because Mary was like all the rest of us who are true believers. Brother yeah. Camping. Yes. Was God a, a carpenter? Was God a carpenter? Yes. Jesus, in his human nature, until he was almost 35 years of age, was skilled, uh, was trained as a carpenter. The Bible does teach that. He was busy uh, working like any other human be uh, being at a craft. And uh, then, of course, once... Uh, he uh, was baptized and announced as the Lamb of God. He w wasn't in the carpenter trade anymore. His trade now was to uh, to build lives for the kingdom of God. Where do we find that in the Bible? Matthew, or we find that in Mark chapter 6. In Mark chapter 6, we read in uh, uh, verse 3, Jesus has come to his hometown, Nazareth, uh, to preach, and uh, his fellow uh, fr his friends uh, his, uh, who lived in that town said, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of G James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. Yeah, Brother Camp, I had a couple of questions. Um, uh, the first was, you were mentioning the uh, Absalom David uh, scenario a little earlier. 
is there any spiritual significance to Absalom being or Absalom driving David, who is, you know, highly typifies Christ, out of Jerusalem, where David has to wander in the wilderness for a while and then, um, you know, kind of fight his way back in. Is there any spiritual significance to that story? No question at all. It has, has deep spiritual significance, but it happens to be a chapter that I have never, never worked on seriously, and so I'm not qualified to speak to it. But there isn't any question at all that it has to fit in uh, in, in in the gospel, uh, uh, that it has deep spiritual meaning. It is not put there accidentally, but it, or coincidentally, or just as a story or a historical event. It is teaching an aspect of the gospel. But I, I'm not qualified to, to, to uh, speak to it because I just have never worked on that chapter. I have another question now. The, um, the, the matter of, um, of election, the, the whole doctrine of election, um, gets a lot of, uh, I guess, notice on this particular program. And I guess it's because people either can't understand it or don't want to understand it. I'm not exactly sure, but... Is there any requirement for people to understand that uh, particular doctrine? Or it can is. they just go forward and say, well, I have trust in Christ my Savior, and that's all I need to worry about? It's a very, very important piece of information that we have to know about. Because uh, let, me, let, me tell you, let me give you an illustration. In the Old Testament, God... Uh, gave the seventh day Sabbath command that there was not to be done any work on the seventh day Sabbath. Now that God explained that that seventh day Sabbath no work ordinance was pointing to the fact that as we try to become saved, we are not to try to do any work at all on our part. We have to recognize it is all on God's part fact is, it is so serious that God gave a, a living illustration in Numbers 15 where there was a man who picked up a few sticks on the Sabbath day. Very minor infraction. He didn't make a fire. He didn't cook a dinner. He didn't build anything. Uh, he just picked up a few sticks. And... Uh, and uh, I, uh, Moses went to God and asked, what should we do to this man? And God said, stone him to death. For picking up a few sticks, he's going to be killed. He's going to be stoned to death. Yep, he's got to be stoned to death. And the Bible says that Moses stoned, had him stoned to death. Now, what is God teaching here? That man was a picture of someone who is putting his trust uh, in the fact that, yes, Christ saved me. He kept Seventh-day Sabbath, basically. All the work was done by Christ. But he did a tiny bit of work himself. It's like someone who is saying, yes, Christ did all the work to save me, but I also made a tiny contribution. I accepted Christ, or I began to believe in him, or I repented of my sins, or I, it's just a tiny bit that I added, and that made the difference in getting me be, to become saved. And God is saying, now, what happened to the man that picked up a few sticks? He was stoned to death. In other words, those who, who are putting any kind of a trust in anything, any contribution they made to their salvation are still under the wrath of God. So it's absolutely serious. And, and the fact that God did all the work begins with this very important teaching of the Bible that God chose from the very beginning of time whom he would save. That it all began with God's action. And then he had to take upon himself every sin of that individual and we can't have any part in that and and be found guilty and pay for that sin and then on top of that he finally had to apply the word of god to the life of that individual and make him a brand new personality in his soul existence 
uh, so that in his new soul the Holy Spirit would indwell him and he would have eternal life. And that was altogether the action of Christ. And so anyone who's become saved uh, uh, has to know absolutely it's nothing I deserve, nothing I deserve, nothing I made a contribution to. It was because God elected me, and I don't understand why in the world he would have elected me, but uh, otherwise I could never have become saved. So it's an integral part of a very, very important doctrine of the Bible.